Hi guys, so I recently filmed a video about EDS and someone asked me if I could include HSD. My video was already filmed and I felt terrible because all of it does apply to HSD and so I've had a go at adapting the video. In some instances there will be awkward voiceovers where I'm literally saying HSD over me blatantly saying EDS because this does all apply to HSD and I really hope this video can help you learn about it so I don't know how long I will keep up <laughs> the adaptations of it because really there just is not a lot of difference between HSD and EDS. There's a misconception that HSD is more mild and it's not always true. Actually, a lot of people with HSD are often misdiagnosed and they do have EDS. And then there's also the fact that EDS itself is a group of 13 conditions and the line between the two is just very hazy. Essentially, the conditions are very similar and everything in this video does apply. So I will adapt my video as much as I can. So I hope this clears that up. Everything in this video does relate to HSD. So I hope you enjoy learning with me. Let's get into it. So I wanted to do a video like this because when you Google HSD, you're often doing so because you want to see what this thing is and how it affects people. But I have found that it just doesn't do justice what we go through. Like if you look it up on the NHS website, which is our National Health Service here in the UK, the main symptoms that come up are joint hypermobility with muscle and joint pains after exercise and tiredness. And while it's true that those are symptoms that a lot of people with HSD have, for most of us, it doesn't describe our experience very well. And so I wanted to do this video because I want people to have a place to go to see what they can expect and also for people's friends and family. So you might have a family member that doesn't understand your condition, but they've tried to understand, they've Googled it, and so they still don't get it. So the purpose of this video is to go a bit deeper into the individual experience. How does it typically affect people? So just to start with, with the sciencey stuff so that we understand what we're talking about. EDS and HSD are both connective tissue disorders. So a connective tissue is something that provides support in your skin, tendons, ligaments, blood vessels, <laughs> internal organs and bones. So as you can see, that's a lot of things and that is why it does produce such a wide range of symptoms and it can just mess with your whole body because it affects nearly every body system, if not every body system. So that's what it is. And these conditions really, really vary from one person to another. Someone could be mildly affected, whereas someone else could be severely affected. Vascular EDS, for example, is the most serious type because it has a lot of life-threatening complications. You'll see that it says this everywhere online, but actually some of the other types can have pretty serious implications as well. So we're going to be talking about that in this video. So the first one I wanted to talk about is joint problems. Joint problems are very, very common. They can cause a lot of pain and they can also cause instability. Because of this, a person could need painkillers, physiotherapy, braces and supports. <laughs> I'm wearing a knee brace right now, but I'm also wearing a dress. So I don't know how well I'm going to be able to show you. You can sort of see the knee brace there. Um, I also have thumb braces as well for my CMC joint and that's very common but at the same time it's not everyone so it all depends on the individual person. Some people could also require surgeries or an aid to help them such as a wheelchair or a walking stick. The next way that EDS affects a lot of people is that it can cause a comorbid condition called POTS. Comorbid means secondary, so in this case, HSD could cause a condition called POTS, which stands for Postural Orthostatic Tachycardia Syndrome. This means that you get a fast heart rate in response to a postural change. So if you go from lying to sitting, or if you go from sitting to standing, 
This is because the blood vessels can be very stretchy and so they don't always circulate the blood around the body as efficiently as in a healthy person. To compensate this, the heart beats faster to try and get that blood moving, um, but it is beating harder and faster but less efficiently and it's battling to keep the blood moving up to your brain and especially to get oxygenated blood to your brain and so this can cause a whole host of symptoms the main ones being lightheadedness and dizziness because you're not getting as much oxygen in the brain palpitations and chest pain because your heart is beating hard and fast um, fainting is another common one but everyone would have a different threshold for this so it doesn't necessarily mean that your POTS is better or worse if you do or don't faint it all depends on what your body can cope with and I'll put the full list of symptoms on the screen so as you can see this one really can be quite debilitating it is possible to have HSD and to not have this but if you do have POTS then you would likely experience some of these things so what can you expect from a person with POTS and what is there to help it? Well, some of the main treatment includes medications to lower the heart rate. I have a video which you can check out here. This has a lot of advice about what you can do to help your POTS and how to make it better. I go into more detail about the medications, but the medications can really help. My heart rate is actually really high right now. And I'm going to have to take a break. So I will just sit um, still for a couple of seconds and let my heart rate come down and then I'll be back. <laughs> so other things that can help with POTS include compression wear. This can be things like compression leggings and compression socks. These constrict your, they constrict your legs and I guess a little bit constrict the blood vessels and so they help with the blood circulation and they stop the blood from pooling in your legs. Someone who has POTS might also use a wheelchair because it stops them having to stand up and endure that postural change which causes the tachycardia and all of the symptoms. But again, it depends on the person. Some people with POTS may find a walking stick helpful to help them balance when they're feeling dizzy. Some people may use a rollator with a seat so that they can stop and take rest breaks. And then like me, some people might use a wheelchair because they are unable to stand up um, for very long. Another thing that's very common is, is bladder and bowel problems. So we'll start with bladder problems and the most common sort of symptoms tend to be things like urinary retention, which is where a person is unable to empty their bladder, either at all or partially. So this can require a person to use catheters. And then on the other side of the spectrum, you could be dealing with things like urgency and frequency where you're needing to go to the toilet a lot. You could also have pain and UTI type symptoms. So real joyous condition. Um, and then with the bowel conditions, so a very common one again is constipation and GI dysmotility and specifically intestinal dysmotility. This is where the intestines and bowels move very slowly and so it's difficult to go to the toilet. A lot of people have to use laxatives, um, which is a medication that helps you go to the bathroom. They could use enemas, um, look that one up, <laughs> um, and also suppositories, which is a medication <laughs> which goes in the other end to help a person go to the toilet. And then less commonly, but still affecting a large amount of people, there are cases where a person may have to use an irrigation system, which is where they I don't know what the word would be, we'll say infuse, but that might not be the right word. They have to put up a large volume. We'll get onto this symptom in a minute. <laughs> they have to put a large volume of water or some sort of liquid into their bowels to help get things moving. Um, and some people even need stoma surgery where they get an ileostomy or a colostomy 
to help them empty their bowels. And same with the bladder stuff, this can go the other way as well. And people can also deal with things like constipation, abdominal pain, cramps, and all of that sort of thing. Now, the dysmotility and constipation is very common and associated with hypermobility. Um, I would imagine it's due to the stretchiness of the tissues again. So maybe the, the bowels are too stretchy uh, to get things moving and it affects the nerves and the muscles and everything. So same with the bladder stuff, I would say if you're more on the diarrhea side of the spectrum and that's your only symptom, I wouldn't be thinking of HSD at that stage. But then if you had any of these symptoms in combination with the other things, so the POTS and the joint problems, I would be thinking, could HSD be a possible cause? The next thing that's common is a condition called gastroparesis. This literally translates to paralysis of the stomach. So this is where the stomach empties too slowly and in severe cases, it could barely empty at all. So your stomach is going to empty down into your intestines and pass food through your body that way to be broken down and metabolised. In someone with gastroparesis, it moves so slowly that it causes a host of symptoms, commonly things like nausea and vomiting, feeling full very quickly from eating. You might eat a small amount and find yourself full up bloating, weight loss, loss of appetite. I probably should have said earlier, but with the gastroparesis and the POTS, you can't diagnose a person just from their symptoms. A diagnosis is based on tests that have quantifiable results. So in POTS, it's to do with your heart rate and they test your heart rate when you go from lying to standing. I have a video if you'd like to test yourself for POTS at home. And then with gastroparesis, the test is usually where you eat a radioactive substance and they take scans over several hours to see how quickly it's moving through your body. If it's moving too slowly, that would be indicative of gastroparesis and that would allow them to give you a gastroparesis diagnosis. There are a couple of other methods as well, such as a little camera that you can swallow and see how quickly it goes through your body and a few other methods as well. But anyway, back to how this affects a person. This one can be really quite debilitating. Um, anyone who suffers from chronic nausea or chronic vomiting knows that nausea and vomiting can completely wipe you out um, and make you feel dreadful. But even more than that, if it reaches the stage of malnutrition, it can become very dangerous and potentially even life-threatening. So someone with gastroparesis may need to use a feeding tube where they're fed into a tube that could go into their stomach. I was pointing up here because sometimes you can have a nasal tube so it goes into your nose and then it either goes into your stomach or into a part of your intestines. If they don't tolerate that they can also be fed through a central line which is where they're delivered nutrition essentially through the heart um, and sort of bypassing the whole GI tract if it's just not functioning well enough. Um, there are a couple of medications that can help. Some of them are anti-sickness medications, so that does help a lot of people. And then for other people, they may need a medication that speeds up the stomach and the gastric emptying. I think it's called domperidone, that's one of them, and potentially erythromycin. <laughs> uh, I'm going to have to check that, but I think those are the two I know of that speed up stomach emptying. I also want to mention as well that even though it's common for people to be underweight with gastroparesis or to have feeding tubes and things like that, you could also have someone that has weight gain from it and deals with a lot of bloating. And so it's important to know that there is no look to gastroparesis. It's not just the thin person with a feeding tube. It could be someone who's a bit larger that doesn't have a feeding tube. And that's not to say that they don't struggle with it just as much. So yeah, that one can be common as well. 
And then the last way that HSD often affects people is by causing a condition called MCAS or mast cell activation syndrome. So I've very recently had mast cell problems diagnosed and <laughs> I don't know a whole lot about it. To start with, it put me off doing the video because I didn't want to get anything wrong, but actually I would hope that people watching this video can appreciate that I'm just, <laughs> I'm just a girl on the internet. I'm not a doctor. Um, and I'm not a specialist by any means, but I do have some understanding and I thought I would share what, what I know and also my experience of talking to a lot of people with this condition. So mast cells are a part of your body's immune response. So they deal with immunity and also things like allergies comes into play here. So NCAS can cause you to have a lot of different allergies and these allergies can also come and go. You might find yourself allergic to something on one day and not another day. Um, <laughs> it's a very, I don't know if you'd say like temperamental disorder. So that of course can make things really tricky for someone suffering with MCAS because they could suddenly find themselves with a new trigger and not know what's causing it. And in a person with mast cell activation syndrome, they have the normal amount of mast cells, but they're not functioning in a productive and typical way. And that's what causes the issues. This can cause things that are really extreme, such as anaphylaxis. Um, as far as I understand it, the anaphylaxis is slightly different to a typical allergy, but no less severe. It's still a very serious uh, condition when you have anaphylaxis of any form. I know a couple of people that have suffered terribly from this, so I've seen how severe it can be. And then on the flip side, you could have someone like me where my mast cell problems are pretty mild. I suffer from a lot of skin rashes. I suffer from headaches, nausea and vomiting, just to name a few. But these things for me are uncomfortable. Um, when I'm vomiting, it feels worse than uncomfortable. But all I mean by that is that for me... Uh, touch wood. I don't know if that is wood. Um, not this. I was touching something next to it. Um, yeah, luckily this condition isn't severe for everyone. But with all of this stuff, it's such a spectrum. So, for example, I would describe my POTS as being extremely severe. I have... <laughs> I've gone through a lot with that, but then my mast cell problems wouldn't fall into the severe category. So a person could find that they have some symptoms that are really severe and others that are less severe, and it just depends on the person, how they're affected. Just need to um, reposition because of pain. I would normally edit this stuff out, um, but since we're talking about HSD, <laughs> anything goes. So lastly, we'll talk about what things can help a person with MCAS or just what you might notice about them. So as I said, with the anaphylaxis, some people may have to carry EpiPens. They may have to use face masks to stop themselves coming into contact with their triggers as much. They may have to eat a restricted diet and they may have to be on medication to stabilise their mast cells or an antihistamine to help them with their allergies. I didn't write any notes of this, so I'm just trying to like think of things off the top of my head from what I experience and what a lot of the people I've spoke to experience and just what I've seen. Um, so I hope you'll find this helpful, even though it's just like a patient's perspective rather than being some scientific account. And then in line with the restrictive diet, some people may have to be careful about what cleaning products they use, what products they use to wash their hair and to shower and just anything. <laughs> they could be allergic to anything. So it may be helpful to think about it as an allergy condition. Um, and I think it probably does fall into an allergy sort of a category. <laughs> 
brain fog is starting to catch up with me, which is where your thoughts get a bit muddled and it gets a bit harder to think. Uh, that's another symptom of POTS. So I'm going to wrap this one up and leave it here. So I hope you found this helpful. Give it a thumbs up if you did, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye.